The United States is a nation of many stories. These are but a few of them. America's Northwest, the state of Oregon, the Rogue River running 200 miles from Crater Lake to the Pacific Ocean, People who want an adventure-filled vacation come here. They'll be on the river for five days, fighting and enjoying the challenge known as white water. Rob Cooley, professional guide and instructor, leads the way. This 47-mile stretch, close to the Pacific, between Galice and Agnes, Oregon, is where the river reaches its peak of violence and beauty. No roads here. You only see it by boat, which is the way to get to know and enjoy any river. Of course, if you really want to get to know the river, there is another way. <laughs> On the second day, Everyone is beginning to get the feel of the river and have some fun with it. And it's having some fun with them at the same time. The final day is also the most difficult challenge of the trip. The channels between the boulders narrow down to four meters, testing everyone's skill with the rafts. Come take me through the land and we'll live together, we'll trust together. You come to meet life's plan and your trials surrender to a churning stream. Dance river, black and free. As you take a billion on your magic way. Oh, 
In Martin Luther King's hometown, Atlanta, Georgia, eight blocks from his boyhood home, stands a school dedicated to his memory. It is part of Atlanta's public school system. It's the kind of school Dr. King might have dreamed about, an experimental place where young and old can study, but which is also a center of community life, an open and free school with every effort made to encourage excitement, curiosity, and true learning. Where students are taught in small groups so that each individual receives maximum attention, and new techniques are attempted in an effort to keep learning interesting and enjoyable. Instead of the traditional four-walled schoolroom, students study in an area called clusters, where many activities take place simultaneously. They receive instruction in required courses, but during certain hours are encouraged to circulate freely throughout the cluster to further explore a favorite subject. The staff feels that the students are at an age when they need freedom to discover their long-range interests. The Martin Luther King School maintains that education is more than facts and figures, that it involves the development and expression of a total individual. Students have access to a wide variety of modern teaching aids. Most children come to the King's School as complete musical novices. They are loaned instruments and given free private instruction. By their final middle school year, the students are able to participate in the traveling school orchestra. Introduction to industrial arts is given so that those interested can develop their skills early. The indoor swimming pool is used both for the school and the community. The school stays open six days a week until 10 at night, offering a variety of recreational activities. Adult education classes are open to anyone wanting to learn a new skill, or better, an old one. Civic groups and clubs use the assembly area for meetings. In fact, the facilities of the King's School are at the disposal of the entire community. Children want to learn. That is the first premise of the Martin Luther King Middle School. Given this environment and the right understanding, Education happens easier and faster. Yeah. 
The Martin Luther King School, a living memorial. As the United States celebrates its 200th birthday, a village one hour's drive from New York City looks to 1980 and its own 300th birthday. Built on land purchased from the Indians, Bedford Village is proud of its heritage. It is a place where fine old things are still appreciated. But Bedford Village is more than a sanctuary from urban life. It is people, people who are determined to live in a modern world without destroying their past. Bedford's pride in its past is linked to its most famous resident, John Jay. He was one of the nation's founding fathers, president of the Continental Congress, peace commissioner, minister to Spain, secretary for foreign affairs, and the first chief justice of the Supreme Court. 8 generations of Jay's descendants lived in this farmhouse which Jay rebuilt for his retirement. It contains many of his original belongings. He wrote numerous articles which helped establish a constitutional government. Sixty years ago, concerned residents formed a historical society to save an old church. Today, this same building serves as their meeting house. I want to welcome you all to this 59th annual meeting of the Bedford Historical Society. As the notice that you all received said, this annual meeting... The society now owns or maintains eight historic buildings. The president of the society reports on the refurbishing of one. It has been expensive, but I think anybody who looks at that building now ought to be proud of the condition in which it is, and it's certainly a tribute to the, what the society is trying to do. The Historical Society is also an effective forum for problems. The Postal Department wanted to change the location of the village post office, but the small old building, originally a harness shop, is a favorite meeting place, and citizen opposition is having its effect. The Bedford Courthouse was the first building to rise after the village was burned during the American Revolution. It was built in 1787, two years before George Washington became the nation's first president. Volunteers from the Historic Society act as guides and tell visitors about this court's first session. The vice president under Thomas Jefferson, Aaron Burr, argued cases here almost 200 years ago. In 19th century America, a child's first schooling often took place in a one-room schoolhouse, used continuously for nearly 100 years. This school is now a museum. Many of colonial America's distinguished citizens received their higher education at the Bedford Academy. It still serves the community as the village library. At the edge of the 300-year-old burying ground stands an old general store. Today it is an antique shop. Rental income from this and other old properties helped defray costly maintenance expenses of these historic buildings. Across the street, a house built over 100 years ago brings income from offices and a gift shop. Special community programs encourage a better understanding of the past and help preserve a special heritage for future generations.
the enduring qualities of this New York village are best symbolized by the Bedford Oak. It has flourished here for 500 years. Independent and unconventional, the Art Students League of New York probably has had more influence on the course of American art than any other institution. The League is a working democracy. The students make all administrative decisions. There are no entrance requirements and no degrees. Anyone can enroll in any class regardless of experience. Beginners and advanced students work side by side. More than 800 major artists have learned their craft here, from Western painter Frederick Remington to abstract expressionist Jackson Pollock and sculptor Alexander Calder. In its belief that art is best taught by artists, the League employs instructors who, like American painter Norman Lewis, are prominent in their own right. But most of all, the League insists on the basics, such as the ability to draw, paint, or sculpt a likeness of the human form. The League was founded in a warehouse in 1875 by former students of the National Academy of Design. Their aims were to offer a thorough instruction in drawing, painting, and sculpture, and to cultivate a fraternal spirit among art students. These ideals, plus the opportunity to work with a live model under a leading artist instructor, survived the League's move in 1892 to its present building, among the fashionable shops and art galleries of New York's 57th Street. You got the height of the ribcage, and then double it. You find the top of the head to be about there. One of the most popular instructors is Robert Beverly Hale, who has taught anatomy for over 30 years. That's what you're going to see. And that's the way we break our bodies into planes, you see. Uh, on this foot, the great character of the foot is... is very Once a League student himself, Hale believes in thorough analysis of the elements of drawing, light, plane, mass, proportion, and perspective. The upright position. Teaching at the Art Students League tends to be a lifelong occupation. Jose de Creef, one of the world's best-known sculptors, is 92 and still puts in two full days a week. His artistic reputation and vigorous personality attract students to his classes from all over the world. Born in Spain, de Creef spent his student days in Paris with compatriots Pablo Picasso and Juan Gris. He is an advocate of direct carving in rough stone and encourages his students to discover the beauty in natural form. This much more? No, 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 this is, this is just a good yeah. yeah. Just a little, little bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the best thing. <laughs> students interested in abstract art can enroll in the class taught by Theodoros Stamos, a major figure in modern American painting. So you know, Earl, as you come up, scatter, break up the, uh, break up this yellow, and as you go higher, let the yellow sort of get paler and paler until it sort of disappears into white. So it's as if the white is just falling down. Stamos, do like the other instructors, the, uh, is in the classroom two days a week to offer criticism of students' work in progress. Stamos's classes get a working knowledge of the effects that can be achieved with color, texture, and abstract composition. Aspiring artists gathered around a master painter, the tradition reaches back to the Renaissance.
Perhaps the most enduring strength of the Art Students League is this unique combination of fundamental methods and individual freedom. And the catalyst is sheer hard work. With no examinations, no grades, and no academic honors to pursue, the student has only one reason to be here, to improve himself as an artist. For the migratory birds on the Pacific Flyway, the Susan Marsh is a rest stop on a long journey south while others winter here. This is the largest single expanse of tidal wetlands in the state of California. It is maintained by the state government to protect natural environments and the wildlife that inhabits them. During the peak season, the waterfowl population varies between 500,000 and 1,300,000 birds. My name is Bob Gill. I'm a wildlife biologist with the California Department of Fish and Game. And I live here in the Susan Marsh. What one person sees in a marsh versus another can be as different as night and day. To me, I know of no finer natural habitat that I would rather spend time in. One of Bob's projects is to study the migratory habits of sparrows. In setting traps for these delicate creatures, he uses metal cages or very fine mesh netting. Once netted, he carefully untangles the bird. The traps are designed to net the birds without injury to them. Ornithologists believe that these birds return each year to within a few meters of the spot from where they were hatched. The birds will be banded. keeps records of every bird he tags, information on the bird's weight, molting, and wingspan. This information is made available throughout the world, making it possible for others to share in the research information. The great blue heron is one of the more spectacular birds in the marsh. This graceful bird has a wingspan of 12 feet and yet weighs only about four pounds. They are barely more than skin, bones, and feathers. Making their nests high atop the eucalyptus trees, the heron is always on the alert for a hungry raven or hawk, which might feed on eggs should the nest be unattended too long. Here in the tidal bay marshes is where life begins, often building upon waste material from both man and animal. The marsh is an ever-changing environment. Occasionally human controls are needed to assist the process. Controlled fires are used to clear this area of excess reeds. This maintains the balance between plant life and open water, so that the marsh can provide a maximum nesting area for the waterfowl. The beauty of the marsh is subtle. 
its function not readily apparent, except to the multitude of living things that depend on the established order provided by nature.